All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another uh, SYNC class for Komsai One Operating Systems. And uh, for today, we're going to discuss chapter 36, which is uh, I.O. devices. So in the previous uh, lectures, we focused on things like uh, the virtualization of the CPU and the memory which we, we know are primary resources when it comes to computer system. And uh, we also talk about concurrency, which is also uh, an important uh, topic in other systems because we have multiple cores and multiple uh, processors. Right? Now for today, we're going to talk about IO devices. Now, although basically a computer can work by just having a processor and the main memory because of the von Neumann architecture. The, the computer also need to, uh, we also need to understand how IO devices work because uh, some processes will probably need some inputs and then produce some outputs, right? I said, uh, of course, we cannot just use a computer to perform some computation, so it has to, but for the input, we can put the data directly into the main memory, write directly to the main memory. And for the output, we don't get an output. We just get read that from the memory also. But for usability of a computer system, we need to have some form of input and output uh, uh, devices, right? Uh, in this example, I think the basic uh, requirement for input will be a keyboard wherein the user can type in the, the, the inputs or the data. Or you can also have the disk, wherein the disk is used as a secondary storage for persistent storage, because we know that the main memory is volatile, meaning when you power up the computer and any data in the main memory is not. So you have to write it down to the disk, which is a secondary storage, so that when you boot the machine up next time, the data will, be st will still be available uh, from the disk. And for the output, uh, the typical uh, output device is, of course, the, uh, the screen. But there are other devices like the printer, right? So we can uh, also display output in the printer. But the question is, how are these I.O. devices managed by uh, the operating system? Is it the same the way uh, we manage CPU or the same the way we manage the memory? So we can think of I/O devices as uh, as a resource, right? It's as a resource. So the same, an OS should be able to manage any resource. It can be a CPU or processor. It can be memory, and this time uh, it can be uh, I/O devices. So the main unit, actually, we are uh, that we're talking about in this uh, uh, unit is called uh, persistence. So that's why the disk is very important. Now, before we dive into the uh, storage or persistence, let's look at the hardware architecture. So I'm sure all of you are taking also Comsai 132. So let's uh, take a look at a typical architecture of a system. Now, this figure uh, was taken is taken from the from the textbook of the book, and this is the typical uh, hierarchical architecture of a computer system. So you have here the CPU, and then you have the memory here. And the main idea is you have uh, buses, right? That basically uh, act as the channels of communication. So the CPU will have to fetch data from the memory. So there is a memory bus here, right? And then farther down the line, we have the general IO bus, for example, the PCI uh, standard, wherein the graphics card is attached. And then the farthest end, we have the peripheral IO, IO bus, wherein other devices are actually attached. So you have the disks here, okay? And uh, we have the SATA and we have USB here, right? So why this hierarchical structure? So I, I indicated her here level zero, level one, level two, and level three. Okay, so uh, why is there an, a hierarchical structure? Of course, you have physics, right? 
if you want to be able to access uh, something, you have to place that near the CPU. But if, to, if you want to uh, access something fast, you have to place that near the CPU, for example. So that's why the memory is very near the CPU. Now for the others, they can be brought uh, farther uh, away from the CPU because sometimes they do not need the high performance, uh, high performance, right? So like the disk, right? But for the memory and the graphics, they should be near the CPU, right? Another one is because of cost. So, uh, if you if you put everything near the, of course you have the option of putting this near the the CPU, but that will uh, incur higher costs, right? So that's uh, the hardware architecture. Now, most manufacturers will have to basically compete for the performance, right? So consumers will try to select the, the best system. And they, these manufacturers do so by developing uh, specialized chipsets. Let's have an example here. So this one, Intel uh, Z270 chipset, this is also mentioned in the textbook, but I took this uh, diagram from Intel's website. This is a block diagram of the Z270 chipset. So you can, you can see here at the top, you have the processor, right? So this is the processor itself. So this is the Intel uh, uh, core processor, seventh generation. And then you have the chipset here where the different devices can be attached, right? So you have here some uh, transfer rates indicated, right? And you have the different interfaces, right? That can connect to this chipset. So usually this is placed on the motherboard of the computer that you usually purchase, okay? So you have the PCIe, uh, PCIe you have uh, SATA and eSATA, you have USB, uh, how many ports for that? Okay, and then you have, let's say you have uh, network cards. Okay, so these are part of uh, uh, the system that you usually buy. And most manufacturers will try to um, uh, compete okay, by developing this chips. So this is from the Intel manufacturer. Now for AMD, which is the competitor right, for uh, uh, in, of Intel, then they also have their own chipset. So it says here X570, and it says the most un unconstrained I.O. And you see the, the, comp uh, the comparison here. So this probably uh, the, the figure did not, it did not mention Intel, but basically, obviously, based from this figure, you can see that this is uh, the Intel uh, chipset. And you can see the advantages of uh, AMD here. So this is the processor Ryzen. Then you have the different uh, components here, right? And you will notice that uh, you have the uh, higher transfer rate compared to Intel or AMD, right? So sometimes, uh, let's say you are, are into gaming, for example, so something like that, or some processing, so you can use uh, heavy processing, IO processing. So some would prefer AMD. So, okay, we now have an idea of the interconnections. So basically, there, uh, there is a bus that connects everything, right? And the transfer rate or the bandwidth is the primary metric of comparison, as you see here. So of course, 8 GB per second is better than 4 GB per second, right? So, and given that, now let's look at a con canonical or a model device. So we now have an idea of, uh, let's say here, Intel chip chipset, and then you have a hard disk here by a device, and then you would like to connect that device here, for example. So you have a SATA device, okay? Uh, so how is a device presented to, uh, to the hardware? Okay? How is the device, uh, presented to the hardware, right? So this is uh, somehow a generic model of a device. So let's say you are a manufacturer of a device. I would like to manufacture a, a tablet. Right? I have a tablet here, say a thick a tablet, right? 
and I want this tablet to be used in my uh, laptop, how am I going to create this device? And how am I going to present it to an Intel uh, processor? Right? So we have this model hardware, and this is a typical for most hardware, meaning the hardware or the developer, the manufacturer of a device will have to provide uh, these uh, elements. Okay? The first one is the availability of registers. So typically we have three registers for a device to be controlled by the processor. It has to have some registers, at, at least three. You have the status register, the command register, and the data register. So this forms part of the interface of the device, such that when I plug in my tablet on this computer, this Lenovo, uh, the system will recognize, uh, will, will have uh, these registers available so that the processor can control these registers. Recall that registers are uh, fast storage devices, right? So the CPU has a set of general purpose registers while a device have a device has a specific set of device registers that the processor can read and write to to control the device right so this is the upper part right, of a device then the lower part will be the internals of the device okay so if i have a tablet here then there must be some circuitry that will allow the tablet to read the position of the pen while it's on top of the tablet. And then there's a, probably some circuitry, like probably uh, specific or specialized chips that will be used to detect the position of my tablet or whether my, uh, the pen is uh, uh, has, has contact to the tablet itself, right? So that's the idea. So, the, so there are two parts. We have the interface, which is presented to the processor in the internals which basically describes how the device works internally. So if you have a disk, then there are circuitry to store and manage information on the disk, right? If you have a mouse or a keyboard, then they have different chips, right? If you have a network arm to be able to connect to the network, then we also have a different uh, circuitry for that. Okay, so given, now that we have this uh, device, now let's look at the protocol. So a protocol is basically just a set of rules or guidelines that describes how the interaction of two communicating two communicating entities will happen. So if we have an I/O device, there's actually a form of communication, and when there's a, when there's communication, there should be a protocol so that the communication will happen smoothly. So what, who are, uh, what are the two communicating entities? One is the processor, and the other one is the uh, device itself. So we have a canonical protocol. So this is a typical, typical flow okay, or protocol uh, when, communicate, when a processor is communicating to a device. So first, so there's going to be a use of the registers, right? So you see here the a while loop. So while status equals BC. So this is basically uh, waiting. If the if, uh, usually most devices can only be used. Let's say uh, okay. Uh, to put this into context, a processor can have many processes, right? So you have concurrency, right? And if you have a lot of threads, and these threads try to access a device only one thread should be able to access the device. For example, I have here uh, one node that open. I have one node open and one node is accessing my tablet, right? So a uh, one node is a process, right? So only one node, at, at, uh, only one process at a time should be able to access the tablet. So if one node, if I am, if one node is using my tablet, then the status will be DC. Right, of this tablet. So while status equals busy, I wait until the device is not busy. So if there is another process, let's say I open open board, right? And open board will try to use my tablet. If if open board detects that uh, 
one note is using my tablet, then it cannot use the, the tablet. So this is an important aspect. So when checking whether the device is busy or not. Okay? Then if eventually the, the device is no longer busy, then we simply write data uh, to the data register. So to do that, let's say read. For example, OneNote will send uh, read the position of the pen. Right? So it will write uh, some value that will that will be interpreted by the circuitry of the, the tablet that, okay, uh, this process is trying to read the position of the pen. Okay? And then uh, it will write the command to the data register, let's say send, uh, let's say uh, check position, okay? And then the circuitry of the device will execute, uh, will perform the operation, okay? the hardware. And then, uh, there is a loop here uh, while status is busy, meaning uh, when the device or my tablet, for example, perform the operation, uh, it is not necessarily uh, will get the result. Right? The process will not immediately get the result because the hardware will have will take some time to process the, the operation. So there should be a uh, uh, I'll wait again here to wait for the completion of the IO operation. Okay, so essentially we have a four-step process for a protocol. Okay, checking the if the device is busy, then writing to the data register, uh, writing to the command register, and eventually waiting for the result of the IO operation. Okay? Now this part here is what is called as polling. Okay. So you continue. So basically, you just check. Uh, recall our discussion about threads. Right? So basically, just the, the processor will just check continuously whether this variable or this register is uh, set or not. Right? So this is an example of uh, what they call a program I/O, right? Because the CPU is involved in the so in the in doing the I/O. The CPU is involved in doing the I/O, okay? so that's why it's called program I/O. Uh, specifically in the data movement, okay? if the CPU is involved, for example, a, a while ago I was let's say the, the the command is to read the position of the pen on the tablet. Okay? If the CPU is involved in transferring the position of the pen on the tablet from the device to the main memory then that is called program I, right? So the question is, given that, is this protocol good, right? Uh, please reserve your questions later, okay? So uh, is this protocol good, okay? So the answer is no, because you already know this in the concurrency unit, we are talking about BC waiting. So this part here, the CPU is doing nothing. It simply pulls. Okay, or basically it loops just to check whether this register is busy or not. So in order to uh, minimize or prevent this, interrupts are introduced. Now, you know this already in the Cisco stopping and the timer interrupt right? in the limited direct execution protocol. So interrupts are uh, basically uh, breaks the normal flow of execution uh, in a processor. Okay. So the idea here is instead of using uh, polling, right, the in, in interrupts, once an IO request is made, the calling thread sleeps. And in that way, other threads can be scheduled to run on the CPU. So there is no uh, busy waiting. Okay. So the thread can sleep and then other threads can execute on the processor. So this is the idea of interrupt. Now, on IO completion, uh, the hardware interrupt is triggered, okay, which executes the interrupt uh, routine or the interrupt service routine. You know this already, right? The processor has a set of hardware interrupts. An operating system will uh, modify this interrupt 
we call it in x86 interact vector table and then place uh, an address of the routine on that uh, interact vector table so that when the interrupt is triggered the isr will execute now in terms of devices so let's say we have a tablet here the operating system will put a interrupt service routine at a specific interrupt number when an io completes okay, then that code will be executed and what that code does is to simply uh, perform finishing touches okay, and then waits the thread that issued the request. Okay? So I hope you, you get that idea. So instead of continuously polling the device, a thread can sleep and then a hardware interrupt will be triggered and then the interrupt service routine will execute something like uh, house, housekeeping Okay, and then wake the thread that issued a particular request. So this figure here illustrates the problem with polling. Right? So you have two devices, you have the CPU and you have the disk. And let's say at this point in time, the CPU, so the number here indicates a process, process number. So you have one process, process one, and at some point, uh, the process requested an IO, so the disk will be active. Right? But the processor here is, is still being used by the by process one. However, this is not relevant work. It's just, it just pulls right, the disk whether it has completed the request. And at least after some time, at this point, the, the process or the thread can now continue execution. And this is what we want to avoid. Right? So a solution is if we have interrupts, this at this point, this point in time, right, while the while thread one is waiting for the completion of the I/O, thread two can make use of the CPU, thereby improving efficiency. Right? So that's how it's done. So the question now is: are interrupts the best? Right? So not really, okay? Uh, polling can be good for fast I.O. For example, in this illustration here, if the I.O. just happens after this, after this interval, then the processor can continue, uh, the process or the thread can continue working, right? Because remember that use, uh, using interrupts somehow is also uh, time consuming. Because you need to trigger the hardware interrupt, you have to execute the interrupt service routine. If the interrupt service is very complicated, then it will take some time. Now, if the I/O operation is very short, then polling will be uh, will be good instead of using interrupts, right? And uh, in networks, in computer networks, so let's say you have a network card, right? You have a network card, and interrupts can lead to live locks, right? So we discussed this in the concurrency uh, topic, yung live locks. So akala mo may, uh, you think that the, the, the device is doing something, but eventually what actually happening is that it's not doing anything useful. It's just, it's just uh, reacting to every packet that is coming to the network card, right? So, in in using let's say in using uh, if in writing a device driver which we'll talk about later for uh, a network card it's better to use polling rather than uh, interrupts right so please remember that right, when implementing a device driver for a network card now there are other approaches uh, you can have a hybrid meaning uh, depending on the situation uh, you can use polling, and at some point you can use uh, interrupts, and then you can also coalesce, uh, meaning you group together certain operations, let's say, and then for an interrupt, so that you have a group of I/O requests that is, and instead of having multiple interrupts being generated, you group this request, and then only one interrupt will be used for that group of requests. So that's called coalescing. Okay, now 
At the, uh, in this discussion, we involved the CPU. Right? We involved the CPU during data transfer. Okay? Now, uh, is it possible to not involve the CPU uh, in performing I.O.? This is where the DMA uh, happens or DMA was invented or developed. So DMA stands for direct memory access. Okay? Why, why, is this, why is this important? Uh, going back to the example of my tablet and the I.O. request is to, to get the position of the pen. The position of the pen will have to be written to the memory, to the main memory, so that the program or the process can read the position and then move the cursor on the screen, depending on the position of the pen, right? So there is a memory transfer from the device, which actually uh, later we'll discuss about a cache. So most devices have a cache, and then that cache, the contents of that cache will be placed to the, or let's say the data register, placed to the main memory, right? And by default, if you don't have DMA, the processor will uh, will be involved in that data transfer. Now, to speed up things, we can use a uh, uh, direct. We can use direct memory access, right? So here is an example here, right? So uh, you have some time here, which is used to transfer data, right? So let's say uh, if you want to write something to the disk, right? If you want to write something to the disk, you're going to spend some time preparing the data and transferring the data from the main memory to the disk, which this one with a function which is performed by the uh, CPU, All right? So a solution is we introduce a device, another circuitry called a DMA uh, chip, right? so that the transferring from the main memory to the data register or the buffer of the disk will be done by this DMA. So thereby freeing the processor so that it can execute uh, thread two, right? So that's what we mean by that. So how can the CPU or the processor now use a device. So I've been mentioning a while ago about that the processor will have to access the device. So how is this accomplished, okay? So in COMSI 132, of course, you are all familiar with the instruction set architecture, right? So you probably did a lab on ISA design where you formulate the instruction, you have the opcode, you have the input, the source register, the destination register, right? Some values like that. So in order for the processor to be able to access the hardware, they usually provide a instructions or they provide instructions that allows us to write and read to the registers described earlier. We have status, we have data, and we have the command register. Now, to be able to uh, use these registers, there are specific instructions. In particular, in the x86, we have in instruction and we have out instructions, right? To be able to directly manipulate IO registers right? or device registers. And these are actually privileged instructions. So therefore, this instruction should be executed in kernel space or in kernel mode, right? So these are, pre take note of that. So an ordinary process should not be able to use this uh, directly. And Another way is uh, memory map I.O. Okay, memory map I.O. Uh, the idea of uh, memory map I.O., if you recall our discussion or lab on the bootloader, wherein we use the interrupt 10H to write to the screen, uh, the x86 actually has memory map I.O. If you write at memory address uh, B800, H, I think if you write anything, or I think in my lab class, I demonstrated this uh, in, let's say if you write at B800 in the memory, write directly on this address, then that gets displayed on the screen, okay? That's called memory map IO, right? So you don't need anything to, you don't need to manipulate any register, just write something on this map, uh, in this, on this address, 
Okay? Automatically, whatever you data you place in this memory address, a byte, for example, will be displayed at the screen. Okay? And then, so, yeah. Now, there are different types of I.O. devices. Okay? And how can an OS use them all? Okay? So right now, I'm using a keyboard, a mouse, a tablet, and a uh, LAN card, a uh, LAN, I'm connected to a LAN. Okay? So, and I have a camera. Okay? So all of these I.O. devices, how are these, how, are, uh, how can an OS use all of these devices? Okay? So essentially, we have, uh, the answer is of course, uh, in computer science, this is always used, the concept of abstraction and interfaces. Okay? And basically, this is accomplished through device drivers. Okay? So if you are a manufacturer of a device and you would like your device to be used in Windows, in Linux, or in Mac, you have to develop a device driver that conforms to the to the abstraction or the interface provided by the operating system. So that's why if I want to use my tablet in Linux, I have to install a separate driver, a Linux driver for my device. If I'm going to use this in uh, Windows, I'm going to use a Windows device driver for my device, for this tablet and for the Mac. I also have to use a different device driver to be able to use my tablet. So unfortunately, in my testing all, in all these operating systems, uh, my tablet did not function in uh, iMac. Right? So probably there's still a bug in their driver and in for the Mac. Right? So, so each operating system will present a different abstraction or different interface for a specific device. Okay? So here is a typical example. I think it's for a Linux, uh, for a Linux operating system. So you have uh, here the kernel mode, okay? kernel mode or kernel space, and you have the user space, and you have the application. So let's say if you have a disk, right? So a disk uh, can be a hard disk, or it can, let's say, for example, a USB disk, right? So uh, me personally, I use the hard disk and I use the USB disk. Right? So there is in Linux, there is a file system interface called the VFS right? that allows me to read, uh, that provides uh, functions for reading and writing data. So if you have a device, if you have a device, say I have a hard disk here and I want to store data uh, from Linux to my hard disk, then the device driver for the disk will have to conform to the interface provided with the VFS or for file system. As well as this is the same for the USB also, right? So uh, this is a typ typical uh, structure, right? So at the lowest level, you have a device driver for the different uh, SCSI, ATA, right? IDE, right? And then you have uh, some uh, specific, uh, protocol specific, operations for these different devices. Then you have a generic block layer, an abstraction again, uh, let's say one sector, 512 bytes, and a block, let's say have five sectors, something like that. And then you have a generic block, block interface, and then you have the actual uh, file system. So these are abstraction layers. The lowest layer is the device layer. So we have the device driver for that. They conform to the interface in the upper layers. Eventually, you got the BFS. And then the way the programmers, uh, for, the program, uh, for the programmer's perspective, they don't need to understand the device drivers. They just have to use the system calls, open, read, write, close to save in a file. And the operating system, together with the device driver, has all the necessary things needed to be able to save data to the disk and then retrieve the data link. Right. So that's the idea. Uh, so yeah, so in the bootloader lab, did we use a device driver to read the floppy? So let's have a short uh, Q&A here. Uh, what interrupt number did we use in the bootloader lab? 
Anyone answer? Interrupt. Interrupt number. You forgot already. Interrupt number 13H, right? So did we use a device driver to read the floppy? In a way, the BIOS, okay, is also uh, has contain uh, also contains drivers, right? Yeah, interrupt 13. Okay, so interrupt 13. So the BIOS has uh, built in. We can call it built-in device drivers that allows us to read data from, let's say, a floppy disk. Okay, because during the early days, floppy disks are very popular, so they integrated into the BIOS the so, sort of device drivers to be able to read and write to disk. So you have interrupt 30, right? So using interrupts, and then you have to place, uh, let's say the sector number, the amount to read, the buffer were to, to read the memory, uh, the buffer were to place the contents of the floppy disk to the memory, right? So essentially it's programmed IO, right? So, yeah, very good, very good. So you still recall the interrupt 13H, right? So uh, here we have a st case study of the IDE. So IDE is uh, an old interface. Uh, I think it's integrated drive electronics. So during the early days, the early computers that we've, I've used here in ICS, uh, we are using the IDE cables to connect hard disk to the motherboard and CD-ROM drives. Uh, if you be, ever use CD-ROM drive, so we have IDE, uh, we, have, we have IDE cables when we open the, the, the casing, right? Then connect, install a CD-ROM drive. We have to So this is an example uh, interface, right? And a typical, uh, a typical set of uh, registers for an IDE device include the control register, the command block register, the status register, and the error register. So you have here different uh, addresses, right? So actually, these are not addresses, but rather values, right? That you place on the command block register. Now, to give you a context for this, uh, so so this is uh, the source code for the. IDE device driver in the XV6 uh, teaching operate or instructional operating system. So it is uh, PIO based, programmed IO based, and you have, right? So you see here the, say, the sector size, and you have the different commands, right? Basically, hash defined, and then you have some locks here, and then you have. IDEQ, ID, uh, most, I mentioned a while ago about uh, devices being only used by one process. So, so what happens when if there are more than one process or one thread trying to use the device? My example is OneNote and OpenBoard, right? So what happens to them? Let's say uh, OpenBoard uh, tried to use the tablet and then there is the while, while status equals BC is true, what happens? So usually, uh, if you have uh, interrupts, you can uh, wait on a queue. Right? So in this implementation in the XV6, it has uh, an IDEQ ID buffer. Right? So that. then you have, uh, so these are some functions to uh, the protocol, the protocol for, uh, for an ID. So, uh, this is the wait part. So basically, it checks. So this is the instruction that I was uh, I was mentioning a while ago. While in B, okay. So in is the instruction, and B is byte, okay, depending on the size that you're trying to write. And then so I have some value here, and then some status uh, flags here okay, to check whether the device is busy. If you remember your lab in the bootloader lab, so there is an instruction there. So you have to check whether there is an error initializing the floppy, right? So this is similar to this process, right? And then we have the IDE in it, okay? So what it does uh, first, it needs to obtain a lock, etc., to initialize the IDE because only one thread should be able to use the IDE, 
Okay, so you have the lock, and then uh, check if the device is present. Okay, so how many IDE disks are available, etc. And then, okay, so start start the request for B. So let's say uh, there's a process that requested the uh, read. Okay, so you have a buffer here. Okay, and then. Uh, you have some computations to compute for the parameters for, for the read. And then these are the actual, uh, so it assumes here that, uh, okay, it assumes here that it checks first if the ID is ready. And then these are the actual commands to, that, is, that are written to the registers in order to perform the operation okay, on the read. Okay, okay. so. So you can explore this later and basically uh, yeah this is an example of a device driver right for the IDE right and uh, this one is this one is the interrupt handler or the ISR I mentioned a while ago so the ISR what it does is to acquire a lock first okay and then uh, if the queue is empty so remember what the ISR does is it performs some housekeeping Okay, the read is completed. Okay, uh, I'm going to write now uh, to write now the contents of whatever I read from the disk IDE disk and then place it in a buffer. So it checks first if the queue is empty, then simply release the lock. Otherwise, move on to the to the next item in the queue. Okay, and then uh, read the data if needed, and then as I mentioned a while ago. The thread, the calling thread is put to sleep after the request. And then when the interrupt uh, return or interrupt handler is executed, it will wake up the, the process or the thread okay, that is waiting on that particular buffer. Okay? And then that's it. Okay? We start, we start the, the ID again and then release the lock. Okay? So, yeah. So, that is an example of the uh, IDE hardware. Okay, so it's time for questions now. So if you have questions, I will stop my discussion here. So do you have any questions regarding the discussion? Uh, I think there were some questions presented. Uh, what is what processor do you prefer? Right. Well, I prefer Intel right, because I don't do gaming. I, I don't. Uh, I use PS4 for gaming, so I rather use Intel processor for my daily work. Okay. Are there other questions? None. Uh, can I see a thumbs up? If you don't have uh, other questions, then we'll stop here. Okay. So. All right, so this is our sync lecture for today. So thank you all for coming. I hope you learned something today. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye, everyone. Thank you, Paul.